Pastor Tony's away ministering at another church this morning, but we have a special guest speaker this morning, and I want to welcome uh, Pastor John Craig from Long Island Youth Mentoring. He's not a stranger because he was just here a few weeks ago, so we want to welcome you, brother. God bless you. Thank Appreciate you, you being here. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I don't know if you know, but um, this church is really blessed. Uh, I, I came in and uh, um, without this gear on, this gear gives it away. Yeah, that's the speaker right there. But before I got the, the gear on, I was greeted I don't know how many times. And uh, last time I was here was three or four weeks ago. I don't remember, but um, I was able to spend some time with your pastor and he was able to share a little bit about the vision and took me around the facilities and I was really blessed by that. And just now, what hit me was this worship team that is here. I, I mean, I, I go to a lot of churches, and there's a lot of churches out there that have very talented musicians. And then there are some that uh, know how to worship, but mm, in terms of the music, and, but that's okay. But it's very rare when you have the combination of the gift, talent, and the worship. I mean, I, I, I was sitting right there, and I, I see the drumstick going like this, and the other hand like this, and I'm saying, I mean, that's, that's not performance, that's worship. And that is a gift to the body of Christ to lead us into the presence of God. So uh, I just needed to say that. Um, when I was here last time, I started into something, and I was sharing about an experience I had with my dad, and I, I talked, I used that as an introduction to the opportunity to the ministry of Long Island Youth Mentoring, where um, you have the opportunity to be matched to one fatherless child who has asked for a Christian mentor. And I know uh, there were three of you from this church that were at our orientation yesterday. So that's how fast uh, some of you went through the process. And uh, I also know that there's some of you who have been praying about it and wondering. And uh, so come see me afterwards if you do believe that, that this is the time for you to, uh, to say hello and to uh, ask more questions about that. But I want to go back to where I started. I gave you a little bit of a picture into my experience with my father the last time I saw him. And I'm going to go back into that and stretch it out just a little bit. And the reason is, is because I've been in full-time ministry for almost 36 years now. And I have to tell you that that experience with my father was life-changing for me. And I just want to share with you what God shared to me as I was ministering to my father and he ministered back to me. My father had Alzheimer's, and by the time I saw him for the last time, he really didn't have a whole lot here. I mean, I could speak to him normally, and, uh, but he didn't know who I was. He didn't know who any of his kids were. Uh, I didn't know his grandkids, his great-grandkids. He was 92 years old, and he was in an Alzheimer's unit, and we hadn't been able to see him for over a year because of this thing. I don't even want to say the name. And... Uh, they called me up that day and they said, if you want to see your father alive, come now. I jumped in my car. Halfway there they said, uh, something happened. He sat up and he wanted to eat. And so I said, well, will you let me see him? They said, yeah, come on. Since you're on your way, come on out. And it was a three-hour drive. So I got there and when I got into the room, this little room, my father was asleep and he had long hair and a long beard. And I'm, first thing that kind of, sometimes I think strange things, I don't know, but I thought, I said, is this your way to pay us back from the way we embarrassed you when we were teenagers? I don't know. But uh, he's laying there asleep in bed, and there was his roommate, and his roommate was in a wheelchair, and he had no pants on, and he was wearing a diaper, and he rolled over, and he says, hey, I'm kind of confused, would you help me out? And um, the first thing that came to my mind is, okay, I, I've, I've ministered to troubled kids and 
lots of different types. I've never dealt with anybody with Alzheimer's before. And it's a terrible disease. And, and I'm not making light of it, um, but I gotta tell you, when you live in it, sometimes you have to find some humor. I don't know if that makes sense, but. So this man comes over, he says, I'm really confused. I was wondering if you can help me. I said, sure, what, what, what is it? He said, he said, there was this lady that was here that said she's my wife, and there was three other women there that says we're my daughters, but I don't remember the wedding. Don't you think that if I was really married to that woman that I'd remember the wedding? And I said, uh, under normal circumstances, yeah, I, I think so. But she, so he said, so what do you think? I said, I think you're married to her. And I think those la other ladies were your daughters. He goes, oh, okay, thanks. And then the nurses came in and woke my dad up and he didn't want to get up. He says, why should I get up? I'm perfectly comfortable the way I am. And uh, he finally got up and he sat in the chair next to me and he had no idea who I was and he was sort of staring off into the distance. And so I spent 45 minutes just showing him pictures of his family and introducing him to the family. But I had another two and a half hours. And as soon as I got done showing him all the pictures on my phone, he sort of stared off into the corner. And I said, Dad, um, do you want me to read from the Bible? And he said, yeah. I said, uh, what would you like to hear? And he said, the truth. And I thought, hmm, okay. So I brought up a psalm that he had taught me when I was a boy. And it was Psalm 121. And I said, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? And he said, my help cometh from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And I went through that verse by verse with my father, and he knew the every other psalm. And it was like, the look on his eyes was like, it's like, like you're in, in school and your teacher asks you a question and you're surprised you know the answer. It was one of those kind of things. It was like every time he knew the next sentence, he was excited that he knew it. And he was surprised that he knew it, but it just came to him. And then when we got done with Psalm 121, he said, he said, read Psalm 100. And so I said, okay. So I wrote, I read, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. And he said, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. And I said, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. And he says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. He knew that, and he didn't know me. And again, one of those strange things, I said, uh, so God, he knows that, he doesn't know me. And uh, I said, Dad, you have the word of God on your heart. And he says, well, that's where it's supposed to be. Because when you get to be like me, you want to have it there. And that was challenging. That was challenging. And what a gift. When you, when you think about the fact and I may be a little bit emotional, don't worry about it, I'm, I'm okay. Um, but when you think about that the Lord was so gracious to my father that all that was eaten up by this disease and he had that spot in his mind where he know the, knew the word. And so if, I still had a lot of time and so I went on to John 21 and I was talking about when Jesus went out after the resurrection and Peter was out fishing. He felt like this failure of a disciple. And so he went out to do something that he felt competent in doing. So he went fishing with some of the other disciples. And I'm starting to tell this story and all his eyes went back up to the corner. It's like he was totally confused. And so I said, Dad, let me, let me start from the beginning with Peter's relationship with Jesus. So I went to uh, Luke 5, 
And all of a sudden, he was with me again. And I didn't read it this time. I just started telling the story. I said, there were these two fishermen. They had been fishing all night. And they got skunked. They didn't catch anything. And they were sitting on the beach. They were cleaning their nets. And this crowd of people come walking down the shore. And there were Jesus. And he knew that Peter knew it was Jesus. And he watched him as he kept cleaning his nets. And he stopped near him. And the crowd gathered all around Jesus so tightly that Jesus looked around and he saw the boats and he got into Peter's boat. And he said, Peter, come here and push out a little bit so I can preach from the boat. And so Peter grabbed his net, threw it in the boat, pushed his boat out a little bit, and he sat there while Jesus preached. And he had a front row seat. And then after he got done preaching, he says, Peter, push out into the water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, Peter is a professional fisherman. Now, a lot of us guys, we don't want to be told how to handle our business. I mean, we're professionals in whatever profession we're in, and we don't like people telling us how to do our profession. I mean, after all, this is our profession. Peter goes to Jesus. Uh, um, Jesus, we've been fishing all night, and we know that the best time to go fishing here is at night. And I just got finished cleaning my nets, and I kind of want to go home after this, and I don't want to have to clean them again, and I'm not going to catch anything. I mean, I didn't catch anything all night. This is daytime. But because you say so, I'll do it. He throws out his nets. The nets were so full of fish, he had to call the other boat in, filled both boats up. And he's so into the biggest catch of his life, he didn't realize all the things that were going on. All of a sudden, it occurred to him, it's Jesus is why I caught this catch. And he was so overwhelmed that he dropped to his knees and said, get away from me, Lord. I am a sinner. I don't deserve to be in your presence. That was the first story that I shared with him. And as I was thinking about that, and as I'm preparing this message, I thought, Jesus said from there, from now on, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I would call this message breathing. And I shared this thought with you last time I was here. The Christian life is like breathing. We spend time with the Lord. We come to church. But it's more than that. We spend time with him daily. That's what he calls us to do. To spend time with him daily. And as we spend time with him, we breathe him in. And then he sends us out into the world to be his light, to be his salt. And when Jesus said, from now on, you're going to be fishers of men, Jesus says that to all of us. But so often we get caught in the net and then hang it between two trees, and it's like a hammock, and we say, well, I, I'm saved, so I'll come to church, but the rest of the time, the rest of the agenda is on me. Isn't it true? How often do we do that? But Jesus calls us all to be net throwers, not to lay in the net, but to be net throwers. And then I went on, the next thing I said, I said, Dad, Jesus preached this sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, and he's looking at me with, and I said, and he preached so amazing that the whole crowds were amazed, not just that he was a great preacher, but he preached with such authority. And he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it but to be thrown out on, on the path to be trampled by men? You are the light of the world. A city cannot be hidden on a hill, and neither does anybody light a lamp and then put a bowl over the lamp, but they put the light on a light stand so it can give light to the whole room, to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine, that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. The sermon goes on. Jesus talks about murder, adultery, divorce, giving, and then he gets to prayer. And we often think that the whole 
power of this prayer is the words, and we say it over and over, we don't think about it. But when you, when you really think about what it is, it's really a model of prayer. And he says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We praise. He calls us to praise God, to go to prayer, to start with praise. We usually start off with, dear God, give me good test results. Dear God, help me get a raise. Dear God, help me this or that or the other, don't we? We go right at, give us this day our daily bread. But the model of prayer is praise. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. And once we have washed our mind in the reality of the amazing thing of who God is that we just got finished praising him on, and then we focus on God, it's all about your will, not my will. Then we are ready with our will being baptized in his to bring our will to our Father who cares very much. That's in the same sermon. And then how does he end? How does Jesus end that Sermon on the Mount? This is his conclusion. Those who hear these words and put it into practice is like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rains come down, the waters rise up, the winds blow and beat against the house, but it stands firm because his life is built upon hearing and doing the word of God. But those who hear this word of God, he's talking to us, those who hear this word of God and do not put it in the practice are like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Notice, the same rains come down. The same waters rise up. The same wind blows and beats against the house. But the difference is the house falls. The life falls with a great crash because it's built upon hearing and then not doing. Breathing in and holding our breath. Not breathing out to be the light and the salt of the earth. That is the pattern that God calls us to. Peter saw Jesus when he lost his cousin, John the Baptist. And he heard that his cousin had been beheaded. Do you ever think about that? Jesus heard that his cousin was beheaded. And he wanted to go off someplace by himself just to spend time with the Lord because he was in pain. So he and his disciples got into a boat, and they went to a desolate place. And when they got there, <laughs> there was this crowd of people there. And I can just imagine, if it was me, I'd be saying, oh, come on. Come on. I just, all I want to be is alone. I do not want to even see two people, let alone 5,000 men and their women and children. And yet the scripture says, but he had compassion on them. They had heard that the healer is in town, and he spent the whole day healing. And at the end of the time, the disciples said, Jesus, go send them away, because they need to go into the local towns far away to get something to eat. And what does Jesus say? You feed them. Now, Oftentimes, it's easy to sit in these seats and think that God's going to tell that guy up there to do everything. And Jesus said, you feed them. And the disciples reacted very much like we react when we feel that maybe God's calling us to be a mentor or to be an usher or to be a Sunday school teacher or to go out and do street ministry. By the way, those are the things your pastor says that he's hoping some people respond to. And we respond in the very similar way to the disciples says, well, what do I got? I don't have any food. All I got is a few loaves of bread and a few fish. What do I got? And he says, bring them to me. Whatever we have, bring them to me, he says. Let's see what you and I can do together. And he took this small little offering. He multiplied it. And he fed 5,000 men plus women plus children. Amazing. Can you imagine the disciples experiencing this and saying, I saw what I gave him, and we got 12 baskets of leftovers. 
come on. And what does Jesus do? He, it says, and he made them get in the boat and leave while the crowd was still there. Now, I was sitting there thinking, made them get? He didn't just tell them. It says he made them get in the boat. And I'm thinking, why would that be? And maybe I'm overthinking it. You might think I'm right that I am overthinking it. But they were professional fishermen. They were out on the water all the time, and they saw the clouds coming. They knew a storm was coming. That's one thought. The other thought was they didn't want to leave Jesus with this whole crowd. They want to be there to protect him, to help him, and so forth. But he stayed and he dismissed the crowd. And then he went up on the mountainside to spend time with the Heavenly Father. And while he was up there in prayer, it says on the fourth watch of the night, which is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Jesus looked out and saw that the disciples still hadn't gotten to the other side yet. And it was only a four-mile trip across the water. And they were in the midst of a storm, rowing like crazy, and they couldn't get across. So they left like five or six in the the evening, and here was sometime between three and six in the morning. They still had, can you imagine how their arms and their backs burnt? trying to row, thinking that they might die. And Jesus went out to them and walked on the water. Now, the point that grabs me about this story is sometimes we think that if God calls us to do something, the doors will be open. Everything will go smoothly. But if something bad happens or it starts getting difficult, it must not be God's will. Have you ever thought that? You know, God, if you call me to do something, you're going to smooth it out and I'm going to get all this good feedback and everybody's going to like me. And if I'm in God's will, then everything's going to go smooth. But they were in God's will. Jesus told them to get in the boat and he made them go. And there they were in the midst of the storm, their arms and their backs aching, wondering if they were going to die or not. And he walked on the water, calmed the storm. My father was looking, and and he looked at me, and he goes, wow. You know, sometimes when things happen, my wife and I were selling our house. We are selling our house. Last Saturday was our open house. Well, we heard it was Saturday, it was going to be an open house, and the storm was coming in. Remember last Saturday, there was the snow and everything? I go, come on, God. I mean, I thought we had something going on here. I mean, we're going to have an open house, and, and we're going to have it snow on our open house? Come on. I mean, I mean I, that's how immature I can get. I know all of you are much more mature than that, but... And my wife and I talked about how annoyed we were by this whole thing. And do you know we had 67 groups of people come to our house? And we, found, we, we, we accepted one offer. And I was talking to this couple that we accepted the offer, and they said, yeah, we were supposed to be upstate, but since it snowed, we were in town, and we were able to see your house. Sometimes these things that we get annoyed about that are inconvenient and look like a barrier is something God's going to use to bless us. And sometimes these things are something that God wants to help us grow up. Because when Jesus came to them in the boat, it's the first time I can see ever that the disciples knew, surely you are the Son of God. God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his name. Why can't we get that through our minds and hearts and and act like it? It's about breathing, about spending time with Jesus Christ and then allowing him to flow through us. You know, the very last sermon that Jesus spoke to his disciples, they were in the upper room 
Judas had just left him. Can you imagine? He had been spending all that time with Judas for three years. Can you imagine how painful it was for Jesus to know he was going to betray him? So the 11 and Jesus walked down the side stairs of the house, and they were going to the garden, and they cut through a vineyard. And Jesus walks over to this gnarly, this is just in my imagination, it doesn't say anything about gnarly, but this gnarly vineyard, this gnarly vine, and he says, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. Abide in me, spend time with me, and I will abide in you, and you will bear fruit, fruit that lasts. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The branches that bear fruit, I'm going to prune. Sounds painful, doesn't it? I'm going to prune so that they'll be more fruitful. <laughs> it's that beautiful picture of, of trusting our lives in the hand of the Heavenly Father, knowing that even when we're being pruned, even when we're in the midst of a storm, even when the, the, the rain comes down, the waters rise up, the wind blows and beats against the house, God doesn't promise to be out in front of us protecting us from the storm. He promises to be beneath us, supporting us within it. And that's a beautiful thing. I want to just uh, close with a personal story that's a little embarrassing, but it's a true story that had a huge impact on my life. But first I got to tell you, the, the sermon, the most powerful sermon my father ever preached, and he was a Princeton grad, and, and he was a pastor for many years. Then he was, a, he was a college professor till 89, if you can believe that. So he worked all his life. But the most powerful message he preached to me was that last day when he was amazed at the word of God. And I thought, how can I read this every day and not be? <laughs> anyway, I was, I was at uh, the Thanksgiving table, and it was the first time that my father was with us without my mother, and he usually cut the turkey. And so this was, we invited him over, and, and he was sitting right to my right. My wife was to the left, and my three children were there. And I get up, and, and the turkey comes out. Our tradition is to bring the whole bird out, and the man of the house cuts it up. And I pick it up, and then I realize I know nothing about the anatomy of a turkey, which was a really bad time to figure that out. And so I, I start into it, and um, I hear this noise off to the side of my house. And so I said, Dad, would you carve the turkey, please? I gotta go check this out. So I go walking through the kitchen, through the family room, and I open this door that's sort of like a back porch, and then there's a back door here. I open the door, and there's this man inside my house. And he's wearing this light jacket, and he has a knit hat on, and he's just leaning against the wall like he owned the place. And I said, what are you doing in my house? And he said, I was cold. First thing that goes through my mind, okay, I'm a Christian, so I, I gotta give him something for this. I, I wanted to do something else. So I said, okay, stay right there, close the door. And I went back through the family room, the kitchen, and into the uh, dining room, and then there's a hall closet. And I opened the hall closet, and my hall closet is so filled with coats that doesn't even need a rack, really. You know, they just sort of stick in there. And, and I saw this, this thermaline sweatshirt with a hood that I always wore when I played soccer with my, my kids. And I said, that'll keep them warm. And then I saw this, these two sweatshirts that my wife had just bought me that one was mustard color and one was pumpkin color. I never wore them. They were ugly. <laughs> and so I said, well, two's better than one, right? So I took those two nasty sweatshirts down and, and I went back through the dining room, back through the kitchen, back through the family room, and I opened the door and I handed it to the guy. And the guy put on the mustard colored one. 
And he thanked me, and he had the other one between his knees like this. He was putting it on. My father comes over, sees what's going on, and he takes his sweater that he picked out to wear to the Thanksgiving dinner with all the cabling and everything, and he takes it off and he hands it to the man. And the man says, thank you, and he takes it and he puts it on and he runs his hand over the cabling like that. And then my father went back to the table and didn't say anything to anybody. And I thought, now what am I supposed to do? I'm a Christian, I should do something here. And I said, um, are you hungry? He said, yeah, I am. I said, okay, wait right there. <laughs> well, wouldn't you? I mean, <laughs> and, and so I went back through the family room and back in the kitchen, I pulled out a brown paper bag and I went back to the dining room table and I pulled the turkey off of it and they had already gotten their food and I took the drumstick and I just shoved it in the bag. Then I got a bunch of rolls and I shoved it in there and I rolled it up and I went back and I handed it to the guy. And he takes his sweatshirt and his food and he says, thank you so much. And then uh, he goes to grab the door handle to leave and I'm thinking, huh, okay, the next thing. And I thought in my head, I should tell him about Jesus. And he turned and looked at me and said, I am he. And the alarm clock went off and I woke up. It was so real, I jumped out of my bed and I grabbed the sweatshirt that was thermal lined with the hood and I ran to my front door to open the door hoping to catch Jesus before he cleared my driveway. And then I came to my senses, I realized it was a dream and I went back to bed and I just wept. And the reason I wept is because I realized I was giving my cast off and I had that opportunity to minister to my Lord. And I wasn't being a Christian, I was figuring out how to act like one. And how can we be a Christian? But by abiding in him, allowing him to, as the song says, know us, accept us, heal us, fill us. And then we walk out into this damaged, hurting world and just simply allow him to flow back out as we exhale and say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. We are the light of the world, but we must abide in him. One, um, one man asked this, this missionary, how is it that I can be so filled so sometimes and so empty the other. Can you relate with that? And the guy said, a broken pitcher needs to stay under the tap. And that's what we are. We're broken pitchers. And this world needs to know the one that we know. And the only way they will is if we stay under the tap and allow him to pour through us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your patience with us, Heavenly Father. We pray that you would give us each the discipline to find that place in our homes and that time in our day to spend time with you so that we don't have to sit there and try to figure out what a Christian would do, but that you would just flow through us and do. And we pray this in Jesus' name.